Welcome to the eighth annual three minute paper competition at Trent University. I would first like to respectfully acknowledge that Trent University sits on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisage and Anishinaabe. I offer my gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor these teachings. My name is Erin Stewart Eves. I'm an academic skills instructor at Trent and one of the organizers of this event. Each year, I act as the event MC, and I am so grateful I get to continue this role in our second virtual edition. This event is always exciting and inspiring. On behalf of the colleges at Trent University, academic skills, and this year's participants, thank you for joining us and supporting undergraduate research at Trent. The three minute paper competition was inspired by an international graduate level competition called Three Minute Thesis, which was developed in 2008 by the University of Queensland in Australia. This challenge requires student researchers to distill their work in an engaging and accessible presentation in only three minutes or 180 seconds. This year, participants were relieved of the anxiety related to a live presentation but they had the added technical challenge of recording their presentation in a single take, not an easy task. We've compiled their video presentation for this virtual event. This year, we'll hear about projects in a range of disciplines, including forensics, environmental studies, psychology, biology, and child and youth studies, just to name a few. They've conducted research in honors theses, community research projects, and major papers as part of their course requirements. These are complex and insightful projects. Each video presentation represents months of lab work, data analysis, comprehensive reviews of scholarship, interpretation of media and historical documents, and let's not forget, countless hours of Zoom meetings. Trent administrators, faculty, and my colleagues at Trent's career space will agree that the 3MP presenters demonstrate the essential transferable skills that employers demand of new graduates. This is the challenge they're taking on at 3MP. They need to explain foundational concepts of their research, avoid highly specialized terminology, create a meaningful storyline about their research and its value, and they want to make us learn more. Because this is a competition, we have clearly set rules for the presenters. First, the presentations must be recorded in one take, and the presentations have to be limited to three minutes. Second, presentations are to be spoken word, so we'll be not treated to any singing or poetry this evening. Three, presenters may use three slides, but no more. And the slides must be static. They cannot have animations or transitions, and we can have no additional props or other electronic media. Four, presenters may use notes for their presentation. This is not an easy task, as you can tell. They're not able to use fun digital bells and whistles, so they need to really inform us and engage us. And you might ask why these students would want to do this. These are not your average undergraduate students, I'll tell you. They're very enthusiastic about their research and they really enjoy sharing it with others. All the 3MP presenters are proudly representing their departments and their college or campus at Trent. So there's bragging rights involved for, for the, their college or campus pride. There's also some great cash prizes up for grabs that have been generously sponsored by departments at Trent. We have the overall prize sponsored by the Office of Research. We have our first runner-up prize sponsored by Alumni Engagement and Services. We have our second runner-up prize sponsored by the Center for Teaching and Learning. And the President's Office has generously donated two prizes, one for Best Visuals and one for the Audience Choice Prize. So these prizes are gonna be determined by the judges scores on four equally weighted criteria. First, language and communication. Was the research and its significance communicated in a language appropriate to an intelligent but non-specialist audience? Knowledge and understanding is next. 
Did the presentation help the audience understand the complexity of the research? Third, engagement. Did the presentation make the audience want to know more? And fourth, the visual aids. Are PowerPoint slides or images visually interesting illustrations of key ideas in the presentation? So beyond the top three prizes, the best visual prize will be determined by the highest cumulative score on the visual aids. And the audience choice prize, that's determined by you, our audience. I'll give you more details at the end of the video, but you'll have a chance to vote tonight. This year, we have three very esteemed members of the Trent University community acting as judges. They are watching the live premiere and scoring each presenter on their ability to engage us and inform us in their research story. We welcome Ken Maley, Trent alumnus class of 83 and geochemist at SGS Canada Limited, Tara Feladrisi, Trent University Acting Vice President of Finance and Administration, and Michael Kahn, Trent University Provost and Vice President Academic. And they're patiently waiting, like you, for the first presentation to begin. I've had a sneak peek of these presentations and I promise you, you'll be impressed by all of the students competing tonight. Enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Kira Parr and I am a forensic biology student affiliated with Zosky College. The title of my project is Up, Down, and All Around. How does latitude impact mice and lynx? Imagine you had to leave your home because a force is completely outside of your control. Well, this is exactly what's happening right now to many animals across North America. Mammals such as mice and lynx are being forced to migrate to new territories and latitudes as a result of climate change. For certain species, such as white-footed mice and bobcats, this means that they have to move more north into the habitats of very similar species, namely deer mice and Canadian lynx. As a result, we've seen changes to their genetics, specifically within their clock genes. These genes play key roles in regulating an animal's circadian rhythm, or internal clock, which is important when adapting to environmental factors such as light and dark cycles from the sun, also known as photoperiods. Basically, it's your circadian rhythm that tells you when to wake up and when to go to sleep. We've seen that the clock genes in mice and lynx have specific repeats in their DNA, which have been shown to change the way the animal synchronized to external light cues. We think that these genetic changes are a result of the latitude shifts, putting the animals into areas with different photoperiods. As a result, the animals are having to quickly adapt to their new environments, however the mechanism of this rapid adaptation is currently unknown. The makeup of DNA is a lot like a book. There are four letters, or nucleotides, A, G, C, and T. These are put together in random orders to make up our DNA sentences or sequences. Sometimes, however, like when we're typing on a computer and our letters get stuck, our DNA ends up with three letters that repeat themselves over and over and over again. These are called trinucleotide repeats. The locations and numbers of repeats typically vary between different animals, even closely related species like deer and white-footed mice. To determine how the animals are rapidly adapting to their new environments, I selected samples of mice and lynx species pairs based on their locations. Using these, I extracted, sequenced, and compared the animal's DNA using next-generation DNA sequencing technology. This method creates and compiles thousands of tiny little fragments of DNA, which are then aligned using bioinformatics so that I can see the final strands of DNA as you see here. I am currently in the process of analyzing the results from our DNA, but I am expecting to see one of two things. One, if the mechanism of rapid adaptation in our study is through independent mutations, we expect to see deletions of some of these repeat groups in the genes of one of the species. This would mean that both species in each pair are separately changing in the same ways as a result of the new photoperiods. Meanwhile, if a group of repeats that is very specific to one species ends up being present in the other, this would mean that our hybridization hypothesis is supported and that the species have mated and produced viable offspring. So how does latitude impact mice and lynx? Well, the results of my study will help us understand the influence that climate-driven geographical shifts have on these mammals, including the unfortunate loss of genetic diversity and further endangerment of at-risk species like Canadian lynx. As such, it provides a background for future mammalian migration studies and provides support for further species conservation efforts and environmental change initiatives. Hello everyone, my name is Yandre Thompson. I'm an honors biology student affiliated with Lady Eaton College, and I am here to share with you my project, which is focused on determining the magical factors in tadpole transformation under stress by predators.
It is no secret that a tadpole eventually transforms into adult frog through metamorphosis. What is so interesting about this process is how a tadpole can change during its development according to the type of stress that they experience. If we take a look at the life story of two healthy tadpoles, tadpole 1 is living its best life without any worries, resulting in a normal and happy development. Tadpole 2 is also living its best life, but during its transformation, it is exposed to predators, leading to adaptive growth and development in order to survive, which has been of interest to other researchers. Tadpoles exposed to chronic stress from predators may alter their morphology depending on the type of predator present in an attempt to survive and live life to the fullest like Tadpole 1. This is where the story of that magic begins. Other researchers have been able to establish the idea of tadpoles changing their morphology according to predator stress. But the story, or what I call the magic, behind that transformation has yet to be fully understood. What we do have is a starting point for where to look, which is the stress axis. It is a complex response involving communication with the nervous system and the endocrine system to result in a neuroendocrine response. In the end of this pathway, corticosterone is released and binds to two types of receptors, mineral corticoid receptors and glucocorticoid receptors. The interesting part about this is corticosterone binds to mineral corticoid receptors first, which activates the stress response, and that has the potential to change the morphology of a tadpole exposed to stress. Whereas glucocorticoid receptors terminate the stress response through a negative feedback loop. Because the binding of corticosterone to mineral corticoid receptors activates the stress response, my research focuses on determining if mineral corticoid receptors are one of the magical factors regulating tadpole transformation. What's presented to you is the journey of what I've been doing so far in my lab to discover the magic factor. With tadpole samples on a paraffin wax block, they are cut on in thin slices on a microtome to then be placed on charred slides to do a staining procedure that takes two days. Once completed, it is mounted on a mounting medium to find if mineral corticoid receptor levels varies from stress versus non-stress tadpoles. If a difference is established, we have found a magic factor influencing tadpole transformation, and this will add to further understanding the magic behind tadpole transformation under stress from predators. Hey everybody, good evening. I'm Erin Fitzgerald. I'm a forensics and psychology student affiliated with Zofsky College, and the title of my project is Attitudes, Views, and Causal Attributions in the Wake of Four Mass Shootings. Over the last decade, there have been hundreds of mass shootings, approximately 19 per year in the US. And countries like Canada and New Zealand have also experienced their fair of tragedies, with the aftermath of Christchurch and Nova Scotia still in the minds of many. And now some of these events seem random, others domestic related, while some seem to target specific groups of individuals, which seem to be in part fueled by different types of prejudices. And now in the aftermath of a mass shooting, there's often conversations about what the underlying cause might be, whether that's something like mental illness or a lack of gun control. And often these attributions can be classified as things internal or external to the shooter. And while there exists a good amount of research on how those directly impacted by mass shootings respond to these events, we don't know a lot about how you or I or how the general community res would respond. And considering the increase of these events and how often we're bombarded by them through social media and the news, it's important to understand how the general public responds and whether they change views on anything like gun control, political ideologies, or the cause of the event. And now that's the aim of the current study really asking, how do communities respond? And so to answer this question, I'm looking at survey data collected by the KLB lab, Dr. Karen Blair, in the wake of four mass shootings over the course of five years, Pulse, Pittsburgh, Christchurch, and Nova Scotia. And now within these surveys, two main questions were asked. Uh, one question that was an open-ended survey that asked participants whether or not they had changed views on any related topics, such as gun gun control, safety, political ideologies, and, and civil rights. And we also had a, a forced choice question that asked participants if they had one single cause that they thought caused the shooting. 
And these causal attributions were then uh, categorized as things, again, external and internal to the shooter. And I'm currently working on uh, going through the open-ended responses to do a thematic analysis and see if there's any themes and different patterns between the responses between all four shootings. And after the thematic analysis is complete, the goal is to really look at how these themes differ based on a number of factors, such as attribution, so whether they made an internal or uh, external attribution for the shooting, identity, whether the participant had a shared identity with the victims of the shooting, and also between the specific shootings as well. And we also care about location, whether we're uh, in the city or the country that the shooting happened. And as this is predominantly a qualitative analysis, <coughs> or qualitative study, sorry, I don't have any hypotheses, but the main goal is really to look at whether or not these responses on any of the, the factors really differ between things like, again, identity, location, attribution, or between the specific shootings. And overall, I hope this research just gives us a better understanding about how the general community responds in the wake of a mass shooting. Good evening, everyone. My name is Neve Hay. I'm a child and youth studies student affiliated with the Durham campus. The title of my project is Disparities, Discipline, and Discrimination, Experiences of Black High School Students in Ontario's Education System. The words disparities, discipline, and discrimination are all terms that should never be used to describe the educational experience of any young person. However, they continue to be represented by the lives of Black students. As I reflect on my own elementary and high school experience, I can recognize the vast difference in education I had in comparison to my peers. And throughout those 14 years of school, I had only been able to see my ethnicity represented by three of the educators I had. And I continue to question why that was. This recognition has led me to my research question as I aim to better understand how Black high school students perceive their educational experiences. From the research I've looked at thus far, the themes of educational environment, impacts from the family, and beyond high school have been the most prevalent. These factors are highly discussed as being influential in a young person's educational experience and connect to their beliefs, attitudes, and performance throughout their education. So far, findings have discussed that Black high school students relate their educational experiences to a lack of representation they perceive from their educators and the curriculum. This leads them to feeling unsafe and unsupported within their school environment and leads them to discuss feeling silenced by their peers, educators, and the curriculum through this lack of representation. When looking at the impacts of family, Black students with families that are represented in low income is three times higher than that of other students. For many Black students, the intersecting marginalities that come from living in low economic areas, such as their parents being in low employment positions or having parents who were separated, went on to cause greater challenges for them in their education. Additionally, research from 2017 found that when looking at expulsion rates of students, 48% of the students who were expelled were Black. It was additionally noted that by the time these students finished high school, 42% of Black students had been suspended once, whereas only 18% of white students and 18% of other racialized students had been suspended. These disciplinary measures go on to become more permanent absences from the education system as it leads students to look to alternative solutions such as dropping out as they discuss this as being better than continuing being forced out of their school environments by their educators and the administrations. It is important to note that the majority of research I've been able to find is heavily based on the experience of students within the Toronto District School Board. And when looking at the analysis of these studies, they're predominantly focused on the experience of Black male students. This causes the conversation of Black education to become more generalized as it continues to leave out Black females' experiences and those who live outside of Toronto. So why does this all matter? The United Nations Conventions on the Right of a Child states that there is the right for a child to achieve an education with equal opportunity. One's educational environment is a great predictor in assessing further academic performance, and it is important to assess the education system as it closely relates and interacts with other systems such as healthcare, child welfare, and the criminal justice system. The specific needs of Black students must be taken into account to ensure that they are being given the opportunity to reach their fullest potential in their education in order to create a more equitable educational environment. Hi, my name is Sarah O'Connell. I'm a biomedical science student affiliated with Sosky College, and the title of my presentation is Disordered Eating, Injury, and Injury Recovery in University Athletes. 
You may recognize some of the people on the screen. They have two things in common. One, they're all elite athletes, and two, they've all experienced either eating disorders or disordered eating. Studies have shown that athletes are at a greater risk of developing disordered eating than non-athletes, and in order for us to effectively address this issue in sport, it's important that we develop our understanding of disordered eating. At this point, you may be wondering about the difference between eating disorders and disordered eating. So eating disorders require a medical diagnosis based on a specific set of criteria, whereas disordered eating um, refers to abnormal eating behavior. So that could be restrictive eating, excessive eating, but it doesn't um, necessarily meet that same criteria for a clinical diagnosis of an eating disorder. Most of what we know about disordered eating and its potential physical effects in athletes are based on research on the female athlete triad, which refers to the combination of low energy availability, low bone mineral density, and loss of menstruation in female athletes. Low energy availability occurs because the energy that you're getting from your food intake is less than the energy you're using. So this is quite common in athletes because they use a lot of energy for training. It's also common in people with disordered eating. There has been some studies um, that have found associations between disordered eating and injury frequency in female athletes, but research in this area is still quite limited and there's not really much on uh, injury recovery. As well, there's been some relatively new findings of um, basically the male version of the female athlete triad, but because it's so new, there's really not much research on disordered eating in male athletes. So the goal of my project um, is to determine if there are associations between disordered eating, injury, and injury recovery in varsity athletes. And to do this, I created an online survey um, to obtain information about injury frequency and injury length. And then I also included the disordered eating screen for athletes, um, or the DESA-6, which is a relatively new validated screening tool, where a score of three or greater is indicative of disordered eating. I sent this online survey to all of the current varsity athletes at Trent University, um, and I'm in the process of analyzing the data, but we're expecting that there will be greater injury frequency and longer injury recovery periods in athletes with disordered eating than in the varsity athletes without disordered eating. Then we'll be comparing trends to see if they differ by sex or sport type. So the results of this study could potentially be used to inform educational sessions with athletes or in exploring various treatment options. Um, but I think it's particularly exciting because it has the potential to directly benefit our own student athletes here at Trent. So thank you for listening, and I hope that you enjoy learning a little bit about my research project. Hi, my name is Victoria Mayetta, and I'm a Child and Youth Studies major at Trent University, Durham campus. My presentation is called, Can I Play Too? Creating Accessible Sport Environments for Children with Disabilities. The seven core values of the Olympics are excellence, friendship, respect, determination, courage, inspiration, and equality. Every four years for both the Summer and Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games, these values are on full display. However, in between those games, at the grassroots level back home, those same core values are not being held true, specifically the value of equality. With so many children with disabilities struggling for access to participate in sport. As someone who is an athlete and who works in the field of disability in sport, I have witnessed the importance of inclusion in this area. However, I wanted to see if the research echoed my own experiences. After reviewing the literature, I came across many studies that discussed the multitude of benefits for participation in sport for children with disabilities. Benefits such as stronger peer relationships, physical health, psychological health, and increased self-confidence are all documented as positive outcomes. While negative societal views of disability can have detrimental impact on how youth view themselves, research has shown that involvement in sport is linked to enhanced self-concept. And given these benefits, it seems obvious that participation in sport should be guaranteed to all children However, research tells us that children with disabilities are still experiencing barriers to participation. Some of these barriers include fear. This fear can come from coaches, the child, or the parent because of lack, because of past experiences. 
a lack of knowledge when it comes to what accessible sport looks like or the lack of knowledge of disability. And finally, a lack of available programs for youth with disabilities to participate in. In turn, these barriers can result in very little or no programming for youth with disabilities. It's up to child and youth professionals, such as coaches and educators, to address these barriers to ensure that accessible access to sport opportunities are available. One way to do this is through accessible facilitation techniques, as well as different sport models like mixed ability sport, which involves creating an environment where people come together to participate in sport regardless of ability, age, gender, or experience. And through my research, I have learned that mixed ability sport has beneficial outcomes for everybody involved. Participation in sport not only has benefits that transcends all aspects of a child's life, it encapsulates those seven Olympic values of excellence, friendship, respect, determination, courage, inspiration, and most of all, equality. Thank you. My name is Kavya and I am in forensics and psychology. I'm affiliated with Autonomy College and today I'm going to be talking about one thing after another coping with the mass shooting during the COVID-19 pandemic. Think about all of the things that we've been collectively learning how to deal with since the beginning of the pandemic. There was the Australian wildfires, social unrest from various political movements, and now the situation in Ukraine. Another such tragedy that we've been learning how to deal with was the Nova Scotian mass shooting, where 22 people were killed in the small town of Porto Peak. And its effects weren't just felt in Nova Scotia, but all over Canada. When such highly stressful situations happen to us, they stay with us for a long time and intense emotions appear years after the event. And how we learn to deal with these traumatic events is our way of coping. We know some information about how people cope after mass shootings, and we're learning more about how people cope during the pandemic. And we know a little bit about how people deal with many stressful situations happening at once, but they're focused on highly stressful professions like nursing and doctors. So our current study looks at how do people like you and I deal with the pandemic in our day-to-day -day lives? How do people like you and I write and talk about mass shootings? And what are the unique ways in which such stressful situations affect us? Data was collected in the beginning of the pandemic where upwards of a thousand people input open-ended questions where we ask questions like the words that you used to describe this day are, events of the last 24 hours you wanted to record are, for the purposes of this study, we looked at three days before the mass shooting and three days after to really understand the transition between what happened as a result of the mass shooting in the pandemic. Currently, we're seeing emerging themes like heightened stress because of the pandemic. And we're seeing themes like mourning alone. And all of these are interacting with increased distress for people who are really struggling with coping with so many things happening at once. This offers valuable insight into how people cope in their day-to-day -day lives. And it also fills in a very important gap in the literature since we cannot plan a study around a mass shooting. Our data incidentally collected is extremely valuable because if we know how we have coped in the past with many stressful situations, it will equip us better to deal with things that will happen again. There may not be another pandemic, but there will be another tragedy. And through this research, we hope to award a little more insight into how people like you and I can be better equipped to deal with such a tragedy. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Erin Giroux and I'm a forensic science student affiliated with Zosky College. 
The title of my presentation is The Key to Unlocking Solutions to SARS-CoV-2. Can you believe it has been almost two years since the university suddenly shut down in response to the novel coronavirus? Through the COVID-19 pandemic, we have faced countless challenges, with the most prevalent being rapid testing, developing treatments, and combating variants. Wouldn't it be great if we had one tool that could address all of these challenges? My thesis project has been working to develop a biosensor that can do exactly that. COVID-19 is caused by an infection of the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. In order to gain entry to our cells, the virus needs to attach to special receptors on our cell's surface. These receptors act as locked doors and the spike proteins on the virus act as a key. When the virus attacks our cell, it will use the key to unlock the door and get inside. My research works to develop a sensor that detects this important biological interaction, which we can then study for a variety of applications. In order to visualize this interaction, I use a sensor chip, which is about the size of a quarter, that detects and monitors cellular changes in real time. My first project objective was to inject these locks onto the surface of the sensor chip to mimic their presence on the surface of our cells. Once this was achieved, I was able to introduce the keys to the sensor to study their interactions with the locks as it would occur in an infected individual. When the keys found and unlocked the doors, I would observe an increase in the sensor signal. As the number of unlocked doors increased, so did the signal. Various conditions were tested in order to determine the sensitivity of the sensor, including altering either the number of locks or keys present. With this sensor, our lab is working to address three of the greatest challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, testing, variants, and treatments. By optimizing the sensitivity of the sensor to detect keys at biologically relevant concentrations, it can offer a rapid and simple alternative to the current PCR testing. Additionally, the sensor can be used to study new and emerging variants of SARS-CoV-2, as the genetic mutations of the keys can alter their ability to unlock the doors. This information can then be used to develop more effective treatments and testing methods tailored to the unique key of the variant. Lastly, we can then test various compounds for their ability to block the keys from getting to the locks. These compounds can be used as antiviral drugs to reduce the severity of COVID-19 by reducing the number of keys that can unlock the doors and enter our cells. This sensor has great potential to contribute to the ongoing fight against COVID-19. Two years into this new normal and there is still lots to be done, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I believe that the biosensor developed in my thesis project can help us get there and I hope you feel the same way. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Saruthi Janikin and I am a chemistry student affiliated with Autonomy College. My presentation today is about animal neurotransmitters in plants. What are neurotransmitters? Neurotransmitters are chemicals produced by humans and animals in their brains. They transmit signals across nerve fibers and to our muscle cells. They're important to us as humans and to animals since they regulate a lot of important functions like our mood, cravings, energy, and sleep. There's research showing that neurotransmitters are found in plants too. But plants don't have brains, they don't have nerve fibers, and they definitely don't have muscles. So why are there neurotransmitters in plants and what are they doing there? Well, let's take a look at one specific neurotransmitter, melatonin. You probably have heard a lot about melatonin. Melatonin not only is produced by our bodies, but are also taken externally to help people sleep. The science behind this is that melatonin regulates our circadian rhythm and our circadian rhythm responds to the environment around us. So when the sun rises, we're also up and awake. And when the sun sets, we get tired and we go to sleep. It's amazing. And there are some plants that have a similar cycle, like morning glories. In the morning, the flowers bloom. And in the afternoon, the flowers wither away. And at night, the plants rest, no flowers. The cycle is also regulated by melatonin. Some other neurotransmitters found in plants include GABA, dopamine, and serotonin. GABA plays an important role in plant growth and responding to abiotic stresses, like not having enough water. 
And dopamine is responsible for physiological and biochemical functions and improves the tolerance to abiotic stressors. And serotonin helps plants when they're under extreme stress conditions. The plants I chose for my study are morning glories. Morning glories are fast growing flowering vine plants. And like I said before, they have a cycle similar to a circadian rhythm. They're also known to have neurotransmitters in them. Next, cytokinin. Cytokinin are plant hormones which are responsible for cell division and they help plants grow. This ties into my research question. Does adding cytokinin affect levels of neurotransmitters in morning glories? I think that adding cytokinin will increase the level of neurotransmitters in plants. And there are many prospects to this research. If cytokinin is found to increase neurotransmitter levels, it can be used to replace chemically synthesized supplements. And there's also research showing that neurotransmitters extracted from plants can help reduce effects of neurological disorders like Alzheimer's better than any current prescription drugs. Through my research so far, I have found that there is GABA, dopamine, and serotonin, and melatonin in the plants I grew. And currently, I'm analyzing data to see if their levels of neurotransmitters differ based on whether cytokine was added or not. Thank you for listening. Good evening. My name is Larissa Jansen. I'm a fourth year child and youth studies student from the Durham GTA campus. My presentation is titled Young, Queer, and Criminal, Criminogenic Risk Factors Experienced by LGBTQ Plus Youth in Canada. Last summer, I worked as an assistant youth probation officer. One thing that really stood out to me was that many of my clients identified as queer, and many of the risk factors that led to their justice system involvement in one way or another connected to their LGBTQ Plus identity. These risk factors are known as criminogenic risks, and they're any factor which increase a person's likelihood of becoming involved in crime. I am by no means saying that being queer makes someone a criminal. However, I am highlighting that being queer in a heteronormative society means that this population faces unique challenges that can increase their criminogenic risk. So, what are the experiences of queer youth here in Canada that increase this risk? Well, my research took me in two directions, or rather towards two environments, the home and school. First, let's consider the home environment. Early childhood experiences matter. If children are socialized to be homophobic and transphobic and later identify as queer, this can be detrimental to their well-being. It contributes to internalized and externalized homophobia and transphobia. Unfortunately, research finds that many queer youth are rejected by their families after coming out, which leads to lower self-esteem and higher rates of mental health issues related to anxiety and depression. They're more likely to engage in drug use, risk-taking behavior, and to become homeless. One study found that in sibling groups, queer siblings were more likely to face both physical and emotional abuse by their parents after coming out. Child welfare-involved youth have it particularly hard. We already know that the child welfare system is a pipeline to the justice system. LGBTQ plus youth more frequently move between foster and group homes, meaning that they face even greater instability. They also report leaving or running away from fostering group homes due to homophobic and transphobic risk. Queer youth are also largely overrepresented within the homeless population, representing up to 40% of all of the homeless youth in Canada. Sadly, they also face inadequate shelter options, meaning that many turn to what we call survival crimes, which include things like the sex trade, the drug trade, and theft, just to keep a roof over their heads. Now let's talk about school. In schools, LGBTQ plus youth are at a much greater risk of facing verbal harassment and abuse by both students and staff, of facing physical violence, and of experiencing the effects of social isolation and peer rejection, especially if they don't have supports at home. In Ontario, we have the highest reported rates of queer targeted verbal violence in schools. These experiences all relate back to and increase criminogenic risk. My research project has made two things abundantly clear. Number one, queer issues are youth issues and we need to address risk early on. And number two, if we continue to overlook the ways that our homes, schools and communities contribute to this population's experiences of adversity, then we will continue to increase their criminogenic risk. Thank you.
10 presentations so far have shown us the breadth of research at Trent in Peterborough and Durham GTA. We've covered wildlife genetics and biochemistry. We've learned about psychology related to traumatic events. We've explored experiences of marginalized youth, considered factors in sport culture and health, and heard about innovations in COVID-19 science. Not bad for 30 minutes, I'd say. Uh, I'm ready for more, and I'm sure you are too. Hi everybody, my name is Kieran Freitag. I'm a biomedical sciences student affiliated with Champlain College. The title of my talk today is The Curious Case of the Missing Tata Boxes in This Waterborne Parasite. I hope you enjoy. Breaking news. It looks like we have a bit of a molecular mystery on our hands. Researchers have searched all over the DNA of the waterborne parasite known as Giardia lamblia and noticed a distinctive lack of tata boxes. So what, you may be asking? Isn't a tata box just a string of letters in DNA, starting with T-A-T-A? -T -A? What could possibly be so important about that? Well, this particular string of letters is special in most organisms, all the way from cats to caterpillars and hippos to humans. It is one of the sequences that can help start transcription, the process where our cells read DNA and turn it into stuff they can actually use. The prime suspect in this case is none other than the Tata binding protein, or TBP. Despite having no Tata boxes, Giardia still has this protein which typically kicks off transcription by binding to them. So, there's, so if there's none of these Tata boxes, then what could this Giardia TBP possibly be doing? Maybe it somehow found a new sequence of DNA to bind to as a replacement. Or maybe it found an entirely new role in the cell and is doing something totally unrelated. My job as a molecular detective is to uncover more info about Giardia TBP and figure out what it's really up to. Unfortunately, these molecules are pretty small, so small in fact that you can't simply look and see what TBP is doing. Instead, you have to be a bit more creative and combine together a bunch of clues to figure out, to piece together the final picture. One such clue that can help figure out where TBP is located in the cell is called immunofluorescence, and it works almost like a GPS tracking device. The idea is, if I can attach a marker called an epitope tag to TBP, then I can see where it is in the cell using light-up antibodies which attach to this specific tag. To make the tagged TBP, I have first have to extract the DNA for this gene out of the Giardia genome and stick it into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid which already has the tag that I want. Then, all I have to do is put it back into the Giardia cells, and I'll be able to see a glow-in-the-dark picture of where TBP goes in the cell. In the future, this same tagged TBP can be used to figure out more clues about any DNA or other proteins that it may be binding to, to help pin down its exact role. So far, I've gone through the whole process of making the final plasmid with the tagged TBP. And right now, I'm at the point where I'm injecting this plasmid into the Giardia cells. If all goes well, then I'll be able to catch TBP red-handed and have some definitive evidence for where it's located in the cell. We expect this to be in the nucleus where all the DNA is, but perhaps TBP could surprise us. Any new info would be great not only for figuring out what TBP does in Giardia, but also more generally for how transcription may work in Giardia and other organisms as well. Doing so may help further our understanding of this fundamental cellular process, all arising from a simple molecular mystery. Thank you. Next, we have McKenna Lowry, a biology and psychology student from Autonomy College. Her talk is titled, A Memory Trace in Two Systems, the HPC and Memory. Hi, my name is McKenna Lowry, and my presentation is in the field of psychology under Dr. Hugo Lehman. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about a memory trace in two systems, the hippocampal and the non-hippocampal memory systems. The hippocampus is one of the most important structures in the brain for memory, and damage to this area can cause retrograde amnesia, which is the inability to remember events prior to the onset of the injury. As you can see, there is a picture of a hippocampus in a rat brain. So we all know the teachers say, never cram for an exam, but instead to study a little bit every day. This is the idea of distributed learning. Distributed learning can make a memory that initially requires the hippocampus to become more established in the non-hippocampal memory system. So then if you damage the hippocampus, the events are still remembered. This happens through cellular consolidation. 
Each new learning session creates a new bout of cellular consolidation that strengthens the memory in the non-hippocampal system until it's strong enough to become independent of the hippocampus. So let's think of it like jello. You mix all of the ingredients together, but then it has to set for a few hours to become fixed. This is the idea of cellular consolidation. With distributed learning, you are adding new layers to that jello so it becomes stronger. If you don't allow for these new bouts of cellular consolidation, you're just stirring the jello. So for my project to do this, I used contextual fear conditioning in rats. Contextual fear conditioning is where you take the animal and put it in a novel environment, provide an aversive stimuli, and then remove the animal. The animal learns to associate the negative stimuli with the environment. So if you put the animal back in again, it's going to be scared. For the study, I had two groups, a group with five minutes between uh, the six conditioning sessions and a group with one hour between sessions. The group with five minutes between sessions didn't have time for new bouts of cellular consolidation, but the one hour group did. They had time for new bouts of cellular consolidation. Then the rats either received a sham surgery, which was our control group, or a hippocampal lesion surgery to remove their hippocampus. After 10 to 14 days, the rats were returned to their environment. If the rat acted scared, which was shown as freezing, it was assumed they remembered being in the environment. So for our preliminary results, we can see that all of the groups remembered being in the environment, except for the five minute lesion rats. There's no evidence that they remember the environment predicts a fear eliciting event. They suffer from retrograde amnesia that I mentioned earlier. Since the five minute group does not have time for new bouts of consolidation, they will have a memory of the event that's reliant on the hippocampus. So therefore, when it's damaged, they won't remember. The one hour group, however, they had time for new bouts. So they're adding new layers to that jello and making their memory stronger and resistant to hippocampal damage. So your take home for this is remember, always let your jello set before learning more. It'll make your memory strong and resistant to brain injury. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah Piccolo and I'm a biology student associated with Champlain College. My presentation is titled Testing Key Assumptions of the Selfish Herd Hypothesis Using Artificial Caterpillars. In the natural world, we see species come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. We also see different levels of sociality amongst the animals, from large herds to solitary individuals. So why do we see grouping behavior? There are obvious benefits, such as risk dilution, predator confusion, and increased vigilance. But many scientists believe grouping has another way of reducing one's risk of predation, and this is known as the selfish herd hypothesis. This is when an individual tries to reduce their risk of predation by being close to their nearest prey neighbor, or conspecific, in hopes that they take on some of this risk. Although a theory with lots of hypothetical testing, there's only been one study that physically tests it. If you notice, in the wild, cryptic individuals are more often found to be solitary creatures, whereas conspicuous individuals often show grouping behavior. So if there are benefits to grouping, why do we see species that remain as individuals? For my thesis, I wanted to investigate if there's a significant variation in gregariousness or sociality between conspicuous and cryptic individuals, and if there is a difference in their individual survival. To best describe my project, I should begin with the theory that drives the selfish herd hypothesis, which is the domain of danger. The domain of danger is the area around an individual in which a predator would attack their closest neighbor before themselves. As you can see at the top of this slide, in a realistic setting, the individuals of a group would try and move to be closer to one another to reduce this domain of danger. To test whether the domain of danger influences the predation risk of these two prey types, the conspicuous and cryptic, Artificial caterpillars were constructed and placed on trees in the drumlin forest. The two colors were used were green and red in order to mimic conspicuousness, the red ones, and crypsis, the green ones. Each color was then laid out with four different spacings to mimic seven different individual domain of danger lengths. The models were considered attacked if they showed signs of bird predation. This setup helps to determine if cryptic and conspicuous individuals would be attacked less with smaller domain of dangers or with larger domain of dangers. Results showed a significant difference between the risk of predation in cryptic and conspicuous individuals in relation to their domain of dangers. Models that were green or cryptic and farther apart from one another had less predation than the cryptic models that were closer together. 
The opposite was true for the red or the conspicuous models, which showed less predation when they were closer together and a higher risk of predation when they were farther apart. We found that Crypsis works best for individuals which keep a larger distance from their conspecifics, whereas conspicuous individuals show less risk of predation when they share their risk with conspecifics. In other words, it is beneficial for an individual to invest in Crypsis or in grouping behavior, but not both. Hello, my name is Jenna Saunders. I'm a student in environmental science and geography, and I'm affiliated with Champlain College. My project is titled Misogyny in Canadian Climate Politics. Climate change is a political issue, but politics is a man's world. Women in politics are more likely to experience gender-based harassment than men, and this harassment can affect women's ability and desire to be employed in the political sector. However, climate change politics is a whole different ballgame. Climate change is a big world issue. It has global impacts on human health and safety, the economy, natural resources, and ecosystems. And despite its global adverse effect, perceptions of climate change and how to deal with it po politically are extremely polarized. Climate change also has social impacts, more specifically, gender impacts. Reports show that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. However, we are far less represented in climate politics and progressive climate solutions. So, what happens when women do become publicly involved in climate politics? Well, we know that women in the political sphere are more likely to experience gender-based harassment. However, it's still unclear how this harassment connects with women in climate change politics. This connection could be through misogyny. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines misogyny as a hatred of, aversion to, or prejudice against women. However, it's so much more complex because it is also a system that enforces sexist societal norms and expectations. For example, women being harassed for being in traditional male spaces, such as politics. The purpose of my research is to understand how misogyny influences Canadian climate politics. And for my research, I've been using a combination of qualitative methods. I've conducted a media analysis of mainstream media outlets, such as the National Post and the Toronto Star, by searching keywords into their databases. Some keywords I've used are misogyny, climate politics, and women politicians. I'm also conducting semi-structured interviews with women who are involved in climate policy making to hear their own lived experiences. A portion of my research has also focused on a case study of Canada's former environment minister, Catherine McKenna, who was elected in 2015 and strongly advocated for progressive climate solutions. During her time as environment minister, she was harassed online and her campaign office was vandalized with a sexist slur. I'm still analyzing my data, but I expect to see that women politicians who are engaged in progressive climate politics are more likely to experience forms of gender-based harassment than their male counterparts. The effects of this are that women could be deterred from running for office or publicly advocating for climate change solutions, and this could ultimately impact and hinder progressive climate action and lead to more women feeling the adverse effects of climate change worldwide. Hello everyone, my name is Sierra Sumner. I'm a child and youth studies major at the Durham campus and my project is titled Exploring Physical Activity Among Young People with Intellectual Disabilities. Are you a part of a sports team? I want you to reflect on why you enjoy this activity. Do you do it for the health benefits because it helps you stay fit? Maybe a chance to see your friends? All Canadians have the right to participate in physical activity. And the Canadian government has indicated they are dedicated to upholding children's rights to participate in physical activity. But are all children's rights to participate in physical activity being upheld? Children between the ages of 6 and 17 should obtain one hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. Unfortunately, literature finds that one in five Canadian children are not meeting this recommendation. 
Even more concerning research findings revealed that children with intellectual disabilities exhibit higher rates of obesity and lower levels of muscular strength and endurance when compared to their neurotypical peers. This lack of physical activity may have a significant impact on mental health, as sedentary behaviors have been linked to poor outcomes such as depression and anxiety. I asked how Canada is doing in regards to upholding children's rights to participate in physical activity. A recent report suggests that Canada is failing, highlighting that limited physical activity is a persistent threat to childhood in Canada. Research suggests that Canada can do better, but how might we begin to reduce this threat for children with an intellectual disability? In the early 1960s, the prevailing mindset claimed it was the disability itself that prevented children from fully participating in play and recreation. However, it is now clear that barriers to accessing physical activity oftentimes lie within the environment, not the individual. I want to be optimistic. We do have a long way to go, but what are we getting right? Unified sport experiences bring athletes with and without intellectual disabilities together for competition. Athletes with this experience exhibited greater self-concept and had a more positive body image. Athletes without an intellectual disability showed significant improvements in their attitude toward those with disabilities. Therefore, unified sport acted as a vehicle to promote and encourage participation in physical activity for all. So where do we go from here? There is a gap in the literature as there are limited studies that include the voices of children with an intellectual disability. As Canadians, we need to make it a priority to understand how young people with an intellectual disability perceive the role of sport and physical activity in their lives, while implementing the necessary changes so that the right to participate in physical activity is upheld for all Canadian children and youth. Hi everyone, I'm Heidi Parekh, a psychology student affiliated with Lady Eaton College. My presentation is titled, Riding Back to Socialization, Social Anxiety in Young Adults. Socialization after COVID-19 lockdown is kind of like riding a bike. If that bike had a rusty chain and a flat tire. After the lockdown and restrictions experienced last summer, People have described this transition back to social norms as awkward, daunting, and somewhat novel. However, if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. Research has demonstrated that prolonged social isolation, such as lockdowns, often lead to an increase of anxiety. In particular, social anxiety. This is a type of anxiety directed towards, you guessed it, social interactions. For example, the anticipation for small talk or performance of mundane activities in front of peers. However, two core questions arise. To what extent did these restrictions fluctuate levels of social anxiety? And how does this compare to non-COVID-19 samples? In the young adult population, these are the questions I seek to explore. Currently, I'm analyzing a large collection of archived data consisting of pre-pandemic and post-lockdown self-reports of social anxiety. This data concerns clinical and normative cohorts. For representation, the post-lockdown sample was collected in September 2021. This included about 900 Trent undergraduates aged 17 to 25. What makes the comparison of social anxiety possible is the fact that all samples have completed the same measure. These questionnaires are scored by participants on a scale of how relatable statements are to them. So, for example, I have difficulty making eye contact with other people. As of now, I'm still in the process of analyzing all of this data, meaning you might have to anxiously no pun intended, <laughs> wait for the results. However, when we do have these results, we can help promote that fact-based 
and numerical understanding of how prolonged social isolation impacted mental well-being on a wide scale. Now, all of this said, even if our social bikes are feeling a little rusty and frankly hard to ride, we can put our training wheels back on and throw in some oil because practice and exposure to social interactions should alleviate this anxiety over time, making the ride back to socialization a little smoother. Thank you. Hi, my name is Athalia Voisin. I'm a biomedical science student who's affiliated with Zosky College. The title of my presentation is Cracking Down on COVID-19 Misinformation Shared by Ontario Chiropractors. Did you know that chiropractic spinal adjustments can boost your immune system and protect you against COVID-19? Well, this is one claim that some chiropractors have been making during the pandemic that has no scientific evidence. You may be asking, what about medical doctors? The difference is how the regulatory bodies treat these instances. For example, one Ontario doctor had provided vaccine exemptions freely, but the College of Physicians and Surgeons barred and investigated him. Conversely, in 2016, a study was done by McMaster University that found that anti-vaccine posts were quite common on Canadian chiropractic websites. 94 of the 300 websites talked about vaccines, and 64% were critical of vaccines. But in 2004, the Chiropractic College of Ontario banned chiropractors from talking about vaccines, and this goes to show how well their rules are enforced. One recent study found that COVID-19 misinformation shared by chiropractors was most common on Facebook. I bet most people watching right now probably use some form of social media, which makes it the ideal platform to share misinformation. So why do we care that chiropractors are sharing misinformation? Well, encouraging people to seek out chiropractic treatment when there's no validated scientific evidence of it boosting your immune system, as well as discouraging vaccines, can increase the risk of exposure to COVID-19 as well as the severity for certain individuals. This leads to my study. I want to know what the prevalence of COVID-19 misinformation is on clinic websites, clinic Facebook pages, and individual chiropractic Facebook pages in Ontario. Specifically, what is the prevalence of immune boosting and vaccine misinformation? Since there are 3,000 chiropractors in Ontario, I had to narrow my search down to a random 10% of Ontario, including both rural and urban geographical areas. I searched within these geographical areas using Google Maps and the search term chiropractor to come up with a list of chiropractors that are practicing in these areas and compared it back to the list available on the college website. This allowed for me to have a complete list of all the chiropractors practicing in that 10% area. I used search terms such as COVID, vaccine, and immune to search clinic websites and Facebook pages. For the clinic websites, I entered in the website address as well as the search term to pull up certain pages that had those search terms on it. For Facebook, I used the search engine with the search terms to pull up pages that had those search terms on it. Any information that was found was screenshotted to be analyzed later. Misinformation was defined as any information that contradicted the best evidence available about COVID-19, immune boosting, and vaccine at the time of analysis. After collecting all the data, I will compare the type of misinformation as well as where this information came from, whether it was websites or Facebook pages. I'm still in the process of collecting my results. However, my preliminary results show that immune boosting misinformation is still on chiropractic clinic websites. Also, I do expect to find more misinformation on Facebook than on websites because of the aforementioned study. I hope that my project will motivate the college to crack down on COVID-19 misinformation shared by chiropractors and enforce the rules they have in place to better the public. Thank you for listening. Good evening, my name is Sarah Saunders. I'm a psychology student affiliated with Lady Eaton College. The title of my presentation is I Know What I Like, Incompleteness and Processing Fluency. Let's break down this title. First, the easy parts, I. This is the self or one's personality. Next, no, this is cognition or thinking. Knowing is an assertion of being aware of one's internal experience. What I like. This indicates a preference for something to be a certain way. Now on to the harder parts. Incompleteness. This is a personality trait. Think of a person who needs things to be organized until it is just right. This person is likely to be high in trait incompleteness. And processing fluency. This is where things get a little more complicated. Processing fluency is an umbrella term that covers perceptual and conceptual fluency. 
Perceptual fluency is based on our perceptions or the external environment. On the left of this slide, the top desktop is ordered and alphabetized or high in perceptual fluency. The desktop on the bottom is sporadic and disorganized or low in perceptual fluency. An individual's need for external order has been connected to the incompleteness personality trait. Now think of a person you know in your life that seems high in trait incompleteness. Does this person also have strict routines or experience discomfort if their routine is disrupted? Do they prefer information that is black and white, right or wrong? These questions are addressing conceptual fluency or how information from our internal world is structured. Information that is structured and concrete is high in conceptual fluency and information that is unstructured or ambiguous is low in conceptual fluency. By collecting survey data, my research examines whether trait incompleteness is related to a person's need for order, not only in their physical environment, but also in their thinking or cognitions. If only it were that simple. In the study of psychology, we often run into problems because there are many different things that impact each other, like personality traits or skills. In this case, I'm concerned with one skill level in managing distress. Often people with high trait incompleteness indicate anxiety when things are not just right. That anxiety leads to the need for order and structure to relieve the anxiety. However, some people can manage anxiety, which decreases this need. This means that while a person may be higher in trading completeness, they may not always show a preference for a need for structure. My research looks at the direct relationship between incompleteness and processing fluency and whether this relationship is also impacted by a person's tolerance to distress. I'm still in the process of collecting data, but I expect to find that overall, people with higher trait levels of incompleteness will also show a need for structure in both their internal and external worlds. However, if they are skilled in managing distress, they will be more tolerant of unstructured or not concrete information. This research will hopefully further the understanding of the impact that trait incompleteness has on cognition and thinking which will begin to uncover what normal looks like for people with higher trait levels of incompleteness. Thank you. And I am a biology student affiliated with Trail College. The title of my presentation is Bobolinks, the effects of temperature and precipitation on breeding success. Since the 1970s, there's been a net loss in total abundance of 2.9 billion birds across almost all biomes. Grassland species like the bobolink showed the largest total population loss. In Ontario and Canada, this bird is considered a threatened species, which means measures need to be taken to make sure this bird does not become endangered. The reasons for the bobolink's decline are that they're considered a pest species of rice crops on their overwintering grounds, where farmers use tactics to control the bobolinks. Degradation of breeding habitat and disturbance at nest sites like hay harvest and mowing, pesticides, and the pet trade have also caused direct and indirect mortality of this species. Breeding season success is best estimated on the breeding grounds of a species, but in some cases, this is not practical because a large effort is needed to monitor nests. These studies are usually based on a small study population. Using data collected in non-breeding areas has been proven to be successful in enabling long-term monitoring of annual breeding success. In my study, we are using the large numbers of bobolinks that migrate through Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory along the north shore of Lake Ontario in Prince Edward County prior to their journey to Bolivia or Argentina in the fall. This gives us the opportunity to learn more about this little-known period of their annual cycle. It also helps us to infer breeding season success based on the age ratios of those hatched in the current year to the number of adults of the individuals being caught during their fall migration. So I want to know what factors affect age ratios hatch year to adults of bobolinks migrating through the bird observatory during their fall migration. Climate characteristics like temperature and rainfall can have impacts on the bobolinks. This is because bobolinks feed on insects during their breeding season, and temperature and rainfall have proven to have strong effects on the insects' populations, affecting the ability of the bird to reproduce. As well, bobolinks prefer nesting in grassland areas that have tall and dense vegetation, and in years of drought, the vegetation that the bobolinks use for habitat have had poor growing conditions and less bobolinks were seen. I hypothesize that temperature and precipitation during breeding season will affect age ratios of bobolinks migrating through the bird observatory during their fall migration. 
I'm using banding data that has been collected from the Bird Observatory in Prince Edward County since 2008 for this study. Individual birds are caught in a mist net, they are extracted from the net, and they are then taken to be processed at the banding station. The nets are set up for four hours at sunrise each day during fall migration. Data was collected on the bird including their sex and age. The birds were then released with an aluminum band that had a unique nine-digit number on it, so if the birds got caught again, they could be identified as that same individual. I'm still in the process of analyzing my results, but I predict that in years with warmer temperatures and higher precipitation during the breeding season, there will be an increase in prey availability and suitable breeding habitat for the bobolinks that will positively impact bobolink reproductive success. Therefore, we should see a higher ratio of hatchier birds during the fall migration. This research will provide further insight for understanding how weather variation can impact breeding season success of this declining species, the bobolink. Good evening, my name is Alora Pasifium and I am a history student affiliated with Sosky College. My talk is titled Mind, Body, and Rhythm, the Development of Music Therapy in Early Modern Europe. If I were to ask you when you think music therapy started to develop, could you hazard a guess? Following the suggestions of some recent scholars, you might say shortly after the Second World War or maybe the beginning of the 20th century. My research challenges both of these timelines and suggests that it was actually the work of early modern doctors that shaped music into an accepted form of medical treatment in the Western world. The earliest connections between music and human emotion come from classical figures. For instance, Plato writes that the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have can influence a person. This ancient idea that music and human emotion were related was later expanded upon by several early modern writers. However, early modern theories regarding the influence of music were actually far more complex than the simple belief that listening to music could improve one, one's mood. The early modern period saw massive developments in a variety of fields, and in the 17th century, physician Thomas Willis established the concept of neurology. He sought to understand the relationship between the nerves, blood, brain, and soul, and what he called the animal spirits. It's important to recognize that the terms soul and animal spirits were used differently than they are today. The early modern use of the word soul is essentially synonymous with what we may call mind, whereas animal spirits were understood to be a force that circulates the body, not unlike blood. According to early modern neurology, both the soul and the animal spirits were responsible for the turnings about in the brain, as well as the overall performance of the physical body. These understandings highlight the importance of the mind-body relationship in early modern medicine, particularly in relation to mental illness. In 1727, Richard Brown published an essay on music and dancing in which he described his understanding of the nerves, heart, blood, and muscles. In this way, Brown's work on music bears many similarities to Willis's work on neurology. His work explains that emotions caused by music can enable the animal machine to perform its various functions to a greater degree of perfection. Following Brown, Richard Brocklesby in 1749 proposed a, a therapeutic use for music in curing illnesses that had frequently eluded the ordinary powers of medicine. When I compared the work of these two men to other early modern texts that focus on anatomy, neurology, and philosophy, I realized that early modern works on music were heavily influenced by contemporary medical ideals. This suggests that music therapy developed alongside early modern medicine. By proving that music therapy developed in the early modern period, we were able to better understand the relationship between music therapy and the mind-body connection. We're living through a so-called echo pandemic, and with the recent rise in mental illness, there's current precedent for viewing music as a medical technology within fields such as psychology. My historical research allows us to look at the roots of these practices while reinforcing the importance of the mind-body relationship in healthcare. Thank you. Another amazing set of presentations from Trent undergraduates, taking us through the sciences, social sciences, and humanities. These students have put in so much time, and so have the faculty supervising their projects. They provide fantastic opportunities for students to practice and refine the skills required for research. That's from project planning and research design, to the technical and analytical skills in their field, all the way to communicating their findings in meaningful ways for us. I always find that 3MP presenters to be impressive, and I bet you did too. They just taught us 20 new things 
in 3,600 seconds, 60 minutes. Now, you have the opportunity to tell us which presentation was your favorite. If you're watching for the live premiere on March 8th, 2022, you can vote using the QR code here or the link um, posted on our page on trentu.ca slash 3MP or in the video description below. Voting closes March 8th, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then you can join us tomorrow to, for the announcement of all the winners that will be available on trentu.ca slash 3MP at March 9th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the event sponsors and supporters for Three Minute Paper. First, thank you to all of our great supporters from the colleges, Academic Skills, Trent Durham GTA, the Office of Research, Alumni Engagement and Services, Center for Teaching and Learning, and the Office of the President. I want to thank all of the participants. Your hard work was evident in these engaging and informative talks. We know this presentation took time to prepare and practice during a pretty busy time in the term. And for many of you, this is your final term at Trent. So we really appreciate your work and the lessons you provided us this evening. I must express my gratitude also to our wonderful judges, Ken, Tarek, and Michael for offering their time during the live premiere. Thank you to the 3MP committee in Autonomy College, including student ambassador, Maya Sitzer, college assistant, Rachel Blafcheski, and OC principal, Stephanie Mulataller. Finally, on behalf of the 3MP committee, I wanna thank you for your attention, enthusiasm, and support for the participants of this event. Good night.